Welcome, everyone. Today we have a talk by Yuri Gurevich, a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan. Yuri is known for a number of things, including his work on the classical decision problem and monadic second order theories. And today he's going to speak on linear time complexity. Thank you, Yuri, for accepting the invitation. Please. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, questions in Russian are welcome. Any questions are welcome anytime. Okay. So here is the agenda. Linear time communicate, uh, computation complexity. Computation model. So why not polynomial time? So much loved by computer scientists. First is practicality. Uh, second, even linear time may be excessive. Let me give you an example. <coughs> examples. So many years ago, I had a debate with Steve Cook. He was arguing that polynomial time is feasible and feasible is polynomial time. And I was arguing that neither implication is uh, true. So in particular, to show that polynomial time, even linear time, may be too much, uh, I asked him whether, uh, suppose American financial authorities want to find his file. So he was a professor at Berkeley, and stupid Berkeley didn't give him tenure. So still went to Toronto and the rest of his history. But when he was in the United States, he paid his taxes and suppose IRS, American, uh, financial authority wants to find this file. So there are, what, few billions files. You can walk through those files, but this is completely infeasible. Okay, maybe today it's feasible. The conversation was sometimes in 1980s. So what they will do, they will use index and they will find him in log time. So here's a case when even linear time is excessive. Here's another case. So for a short while, I worked at Microsoft with two other guys on something, uh, never mind what. And there I came to realize the following. So suppose I want to know how many big queries, uh, unique queries, let me say what's unique query. If you ask the same query twice, these are two, two unique queries. It's like occurrences, what the logicians call the occurrences. So how many unique queries were, for example, yesterday? So this information is on hard disks, but if you go through those hard disks and just count, it will take you days or weeks it's just enormous amount of information. It's completely infeasible in linear time. And it took to, to um, computer scientists years to deal with this problem. My friend Flajolet, who is uh, not with us anymore, contributed quite substantially. And what, what happens to Today, there are very clever algorithms which will give you, if you're interested, say, for the last 24 hours, how many unique queries were there. They will give you in real time, but not precisely. If you want to know the exact number, it's impossible. But if you have kind of reasonable um, precision and reasonable uh, probability, very high probability and very high precision, you can, you can know this number. It's actually in constant time. Okay, so this is just to tell you that the real world is not polynomial time. 
So now what linear time? Linear time is not that robust as polynomial times. It's it, it quite uh, sensitive to the computation model. So uh, I will be using the standard linear time, which is used in the analysis of the algorithms, the so-called random access machine. By the way, random access is misleading. It doesn't, there's no randomness. It comes from old, old days, a kind of, instead of getting number three, number five, I can take random address and then get a number. That, that's where this random comes. So the important part in this model is that memory access is constant time. It's an idealization, but that's the model. Now, let's consider sorting. So, so there are many simple things are not in linear time. For example, sorting n items requires n log n comparisons and therefore n log n time. There seems to be no way around this lower bound. Or maybe there is. Recall arrays. What is an array? It's an indice. We have some indices, 0, 1 to n minus 1, and, and values of, of the array on those indices. So array is a so-called data structure. Another very misleading term. Because data structure seems something completely passive. In fact, array is an algorithm. You give it index i, and it computes a of i in constant time. So that's why array goes so, so naturally with the um, random access machine. So if you program, say, in C or C++, arrays are built in. They're part of computation model. If you want to use a queue or something, you have to program, but arrays are there. Okay, here is a little theorem, not mine. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to sort natural numbers less than n, it can be done in time linear in n. So here's an example. Instead of proving, I'll show you an example. Even though the array is tiny, you, you'll see it's quite a clever idea. Actually, if you keep working with linear time, it becomes sort of obvious. But when you see it for the first time, it's not, not that obvious. So suppose this is our array, 360. So this, all these numbers less than seven. So what we do, First, we create an array of zeros. So in reality, you allocate space and zero it. Now you traverse A, and what do you do? Uh, let's see. For each index K of A, you compute A Compute A of K, so you compute 3, and you output, and you write on the third position, you write 1. This position 0, 1, 2, 3. So I said that array, in, in the case of arrays, you uh, retrieve the um, the value in constant time, but you also write in constant time. So you, you see three and you write this one. Now you continue to walk in A. As you come to six, you write this one on the sixth position. Then you come to zero and you write this one. So you finished. So you created B. You walked A once, and now you walk B. And as you walk B, you output positions where there are ones. You output zero, then you output three, and then you output six. And this way you uh, sorted the original array. Okay. Uh, 
please don't be shy to uh, if something missed. So. Okay. So the random access machine, uh, just recall what, what is a random access machine. So let length be the length of, uh, n be the length of input. Then you have only polynomially many initial registers. And addresses and registers are of length log n. So given address, you can read or write a value in constant time. Arithmetical relations are computed in constant time and plus and minus also are executed in constant time. So this is the most standard computer architecture. Uh, sometimes people require also assume that multiplication and division are constant time. I, I will not need this, so I'll skip. Okay, now we're going to something closer to logic. Homonymy originals, I'll explain what it is. So there's a very clever algorithm, I'll just also not mine. In fact, I didn't, didn't write attribution uh, because a lot of people work on this algorithm uh, for years and no errors. It's a complicated story. So I, I didn't want to dive into uh, who deserves the credit. But here is the thing. So suppose you have an, a string of characters, C0, C1, and so on. Now there are suffixes. The whole string is a suffix and for each J there is this suffix. Oops, starting from J. And what you want, you want to take all the suffixes and order them lexicographically. And it turns out that you can do it in linear time. It's highly non-trivial. Uh, so we are, I'm coming closer to things that I worked upon with my uh, uh, collaborators and we actually had to code these algorithms it, it is not not a simple algorithm but so let, let me give formal definition so as the string array for a given string of characters is an array of length m and on ith position you find Intuitively, you find the, er, uh, the suffix, which is number i in the lexicographical order. But suffix is a long thing. So suffix is presented by, by, this, uh, by uh, index from which it starts. So this particular suffix, cj and so on, is presented by number j and j is the kind of key for the suffix. So in linear time you uh, compute order of the keys and if you think about a key as representing suffix you get suffixes in the lexicographical order. So here is a use A, a little, uh, we'll use this suffix algorithm for our purposes. So suppose we have a formula phi. Actually, when we will use it, it will be a list of formulas. But for simplicity, the formula phi. First, construct a parse tree. So suppose you have conjunction, then you will have uh, left, child, right child, if left child happens to be an implication, it will be uh, premise and uh, conclusion. 
So you can start a parse tree. This can be done using P a deterministic PDA. Uh, one side remark from 1960s, people teach in discrete mathematics, people teach uh, context-free languages, non-deterministic PDAs, which is pleasant theory, but what is used in, in real world are deterministic PDAs. And then actually, there, there, there are also languages that correspond to deterministic PDAs, but that's a different story. Okay, now, so, so this is, this can be done in uh, once, you, you read through phi once. Then you construct the suffix array for phi. And now what I want to achieve, let's see what I want to achieve. So I have this tree, parse tree for phi, Suppose I have some node u. Under this node, there is a sub formula, say alpha. And this alpha may appear many times. So I want the very first, so, so all these nodes will be called homonyms because they have the same sort of me meaning. They, so, so u, here is some v, if, if u represents subformula alpha and v represents some formula alpha, then u and v are homonyms. And there is the very first homonym, I call it homonymy original. And what I want, I want a reference, a pointer from any node u to its homonymy original. Is it clear what, what we want? So if, if subformula of u is alpha, I want a pointer for u to a node where alpha appears for the first time in the parse tree. And so how do we do it? Notice that all the homonyms, if you look at alpha, alpha, consider where alpha starts in phi, maybe in many places. But all these suffixes will be in, in suffix array, they will be next to each other. Because they all start with alpha and then maybe something else. So it will be a, a segment in alpha, in, in a suffix array. So the, the rough idea is this, you, you, you walk through a suffix array, each time you come to the beginning of new such a segment. Oh, this is homonymy uh, original. Now you walk through suffix array and, put, and keep putting those pointers until you finish this segment, you go to the next segment. Does it make sense? So it, it is, if you just try from scratch, come up with uh, a quick algorithm from, from a node to its homonym original, it is quite hard. Okay. Okay. So now we go to basic primal logic. Uh, the main reference is this, it's not the first reference, but the sort of most obvious reference. By the way, Carlos Catrini was an uh, undergrad from Columbia. He found a little error in some paper on, um, on primal logic, on the earlier paper, and his professor wrote to me, is it, do you mind if, my student found some error in your paper, do you mind if he writes to you? Uh, of course I don't mind, so this fellow wrote, and indeed there was error, not, not important error, just a little, but it was an error and he not only found the error, he also suggested a correction. So I asked him, uh, if you already understand what we are doing, would, would you like to, to do some work? And he was happy to do it. So we wrote several papers uh, together. 
Okay, motivation. So the original motivation was related to policy and trust management. Uh, but here I want to present from first principles. So typically when uh, logic starts with first, first principles, you have some uh, pronouncements which may be true or false. Here we'll start, we'll start even from something more basic. So info is an atom of, item of information. It is not necessarily true or false. It's just a piece of information. So one of meaningful questions is whether this info is known to that agent. Okay. Now, let's order this infants. So y less or equal x if, I, if y is at least as informative, maybe more informative. So as you go down, you become more informative. The idea is that on, on top, there will be top uh, kind of something trivial known to all. And on the very bottom will be bottom, which is non, unknown to anybody. Now, when you present logic, typically conjunction and disjunction come very symmetrically. But in reality, there is not much of symmetry here. Because suppose you have two infants. So suppose I have a piece of paper. This is written, written one info, another piece of paper, another info is written. Now I can take them both. And it's conjunction. But disjunction, real true disjunction, would be some kind of a common information. And this is very difficult, how to extract common information from two pieces, from two infants. So it's a, so interesting, so conjunction sort of comes for free, but this junction is quite complicated. Okay, so, so there is binary connection conjunction, and then there are unary connection, we have some agents, and say agent said X. Okay, so this is another info. X was info, P said X, another info. Okay, now implication. So we introduce implication as a solution for this. So we're looking X satisfying these things. So if you think about X of implica as implication, then of course A and A implies B, of course is the they imply B, and therefore they at least as informative as B. And of course, B is at least as informative as A implies B. Now, first of all, do we really have any solution for this? Sure, B itself is a solution. Notice that if you put B instead of X, so there is at least one solution. Of course, intuitively, you would like to have the greatest solution. Unfortunately, if you require greatest solution, you get intuitionistic implication and you are in intuitionistic logic. So one aside that's interesting that you arrive to in, in intuitionistic logic from very first principles. You don't need to do arithmetic, you, whatever <clears throat> the, the Dutch did by by way of arriving to intuitionistic logic. Disjunction. So disjunction is quite complicated because having two pieces of inform two items of information, it's very complicated how to uh, extract common part. So we introduce disjunction this way. Disjunction is sort of upper bound for both. So you may say, but is there any solution for this? There's always a solution. T take this top. 
something that known to all. So the top would certainly fit. Intuitively, you want the, the smallest solution, but then you get intuitionistic disjunction, and there is a paper with Lev where uh, we tackle this. So we introduce a kind of a very simplistic implication in disjunction, but the resulting logic has a remarkable combination of expressivity and feasibility. So now it depends what they want to express. If you want you know, do, do complicated logic stuff, it, it's not appropriate, but it expressed typical access control scenarios. In reality, what happened, uh, there was a, one of the top guys in set theory. Oh, I apologize, the name escapes me. <laughs> He, uh, he was visiting me and we, and we were looking into access control scenarios. I, I, I creating some new language called Decalt. And we noticed that typical scenarios are processed very quickly. And that's how we discovered this primal logic. Okay, now derivation. So for expository reasons, I will forget about quotations, you know, P said X, and about disjunction and about top and bottom, and just leave conjunction and implication. So we have uh, elimination of conjunction, introduction of conjunction, and we have these two rules of elimination and introduction of implication. It's kind of simplistic logic, but logic nonetheless. It has interesting properties. For example, if you take the shortest deviation of a formula phi from some hypothesis H, then every formula in this in 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 the shortest derivation is a subformula of a formula in H or subformula of P. Uh, log um, lemma, which I will not use. So if if you're tired. We can skip, <laughs> but uh, it's a kind of interpolation. So suppose phi is derivable from H. Then there is a set of subformulas of H, which are also subformulas of phi. So it's so kind of joint subformulas, such that all these subformulas in I are derivable from H, and phi is derivable from I, by introduction rules only. It's not a kind of in a very trivial way. way. We just compose phi. Um, we, we will not use interpolation lemma, but in our system it played an important role because often in the scenarios, often the hypotheses are stable and just you just check various phi's and then this this lemma allows a kind of optimization. Okay. The following I'll call multi-derivation problems. So you have set of hypotheses and a set of queries. And we want to decide which of the queries follow from each one, from each query in Q. We want to understand, does it follow from H or not? So for, for our logic, we have positive solution, linear time solution for this problem. 
So I want to describe this de decision algorithm. This will be the most technical part. So the multi-derivation problem for propositional infant logic is solvable in linear time. So in, in fact, we we'll even a little more. We'll, for all subformulas, we'll decide which of them follow from H and which not. All in linear time. So it seems a bit too much. So I'll give you an idea. You'll see how it goes. Oh, uh, my co-author on this was Itai Neeman. So he is a, a professor of logic at uh, U UCLA. So it, it took us a while to arrive to this theorem. Okay. So the way we'll do, we have three kind of piles. Initially, all subformulas are raw. Hypotheses are pending, and no formal is processed. Intuitively, pending and processed will be all derivable. But for technical reasons, we separate this derivable into pending and processed. Process goes away. Pending, it's, it's derived, but we still need, need it to, to derive something else. So here is, here is the algorithm. Repeat until no formula is pending. Pick the first pending formula, alpha, and apply all possible inference rules to alpha. If some formula which used to be raw now is derived, mark it pending. When you finish this, alpha itself is processed, forget about it, move to the next pending formula. Okay. So let me, I'll consider two cases. One, two cases of applying inferences rule to alpha. So one easy case. So suppose alpha has this form. Alpha is a conjunction. So and I apply this rule. Then what I derive, I derive alpha one. And alpha, if alpha one was raw, I just mark it pending. So this is very easy constant time. Here's a more difficult case. So suppose uh, this is the rule that I apply to alpha, with alpha playing the role of x. So I'm looking for any kind of any formula y and derive x and y. Of course, x and y should be a subformula of h and q. We work within this set of subformulas. And if the new formula alpha and y is raw, I, but uh, why is still pending or processed, uh, market pending. So the difficulty is how can I do so very quickly uh, to, to go through all the whys. The basic idea is that I want to deri derive every formula essentially in constant time. Not essential, in constant time. 
And there's a lot of whys where, how do I do that? We don't have to go through all the, uh, through all the possible whys. So it's, are you with me? Okay. So one head is, <laughs> okay. So here, so we'll do some preparatory work. Before I work with any alpha, I'll do some preparatory work. I will traverse the parse tree for all that. So I have this many formulas. If you wish, it may be a, a forest, but you can always have top node and get a tree. And we will create some auxiliary lists. The, the name for them in, for such things in typically in programming is so they call, uh, typically they call use lists. But only for homonymy originals. So I'm traversing this tree for H union Q. So I arrive to node U. Okay. For this node U, I consider four cases, but here I do just one case. So if U is a homonymy original, so I'm looking, I'm looking for this pointer to the homonymy original and it leads back to U itself. So I know that this homonymy original. If U is not a left child of a conjunction node, then I'm done for this case. If U happen to be the left child of some node W, and W is the node for subformula, which is a conjunction. Okay. Since U is the left child, so the U also, the, some, U is a, a node for, for formula X. Then what I do, I take this W, can, take pointer from W to it, homonymy original. So these homonymy originals play important role because I don't want to deal with any subformula many times. I want to deal with any subformula once. So I take this H of W in and put into this list. So this list will contain all uh, homonymy originals of formulas which are left, child which are left children of conjunctions. And of course, I'll do the same for other three cases. Okay, now coming back. So I want to apply this rule to alpha, with alpha playing the role of X. So all the Y's which I need are here. Why? Because, uh, let's see, if we apply this rule, then there is subformula X and Y. And of course, X is a left child of the corresponding node. So alpha the node representing alpha is a left child of a conjunction. And so all the relevant nodes, all these conjunctions are represented in this use list. So I walk through this use list and notice that any conjunction will appear only in, for this purpose will appear only in one list. It also appear in another list for Y. But since only 
find there are only finitely many rules. So I will walk uh, only so many times through uh, through each sub formula. Okay, this was the most complicated technical piece. So this was a basic formula, basic uh, logic. Um, in fact, uh, in reality, we first implemented logic without disjunction. Uh, quotations always were there because in in access control where we apply this thing, the quotation is very important. You know, you come and say, "I want access to this file," and so it's all about uh, such uh, um, quotations or pronouncements. But at certain point, we discovered that we need disjunction. Here's it's first uh, extension. Uh, in fact, we could get by without disjunction, but it, it was expensive. So a very typical scenario in uh, access control is this. If something, <clears throat> if some condition satisfied, then you do some action. And when the condition is satisfied, the question becomes whether it's derivable. So you try to derive alpha, and if you succeed, uh, of course you have to know succeed you or not. It, it cannot be like in our, uh, you know, recursive numerability or something. You, you know when you derive it, you don't know when you don't derive it. You know but it's derived, whether it's derivable or not. You quickly decide and then or you do actions or you don't. And often uh, conditions are of that sort. Say if you have American or uh, UK passport, then you can do this or that. Or maybe Russian or Belarusian passport, then. We quickly should use this scenario all the time that these are two different countries and we have this junction. So disjunction may, may be eliminated, but of course then you get ma many more different cases and uh, things become, ex you have exponential, exponential explosion. And for disjunction, we use this very trivial rules, but they were sufficient for, for the purpose. Okay, more interesting. So this uh, was rather easy technically. More difficult extension was related to this one. So it's a work with Carlos Catrini. By the way, now he is a graduate, graduate student at uh, at TH Zurich. Uh, actually, I don't know. Maybe he's already finished. Last time that I talked to him, he was still a graduate student at Zurich. <laughs> so here we edit a rule. Uh, so if uh, if A implies B and B implies C, in, in basic logic, it doesn't mean that A implies C. So adding transitivity is not trivial. Uh, well, so, so it's another extension. And the most interesting is the third extension. Uh, so first let me describe my co-author, so Carlos Catrini. So we started with him. Uh, by that time, he became already a graduate student, he has less, less time. But also, he was, he got logic education, he was quite good with logic. But here there was a lot of um, real combinatorial complexity work. And I had a visitor, Artyom Milentiev,
and he's a, indeed an excellent guy. Uh, now I think he lives in Kaliningrad. So he was my intern a couple of times at Microsoft. And uh, uh, I always was looking for people who can program as hackers, but also understand abstractions. It's very difficult to find people who kind of have logic head, but also uh, hacker, head of a hacker. And Artyom is one, one, one of these guys. Uh, on the other hand, he, he can't write well. <laughs> not because of English. Just not everybody can write well. So we need yet another. Uh, and that, uh, what happened at the time, I already left this trust management and, and uh, moved to uh, quantum computing. And so I really didn't have much time for this. And I asked Uri Lahav, uh, he was a graduate student of Arnon Avron from Tel Aviv University. Very clever fellow. And he um, actually understood the whole thing and helped to write it nicely. Okay, so this one. Uh, co-authors now let me see what's what's the motivation so in basic logic you have very strange things for example uh, x and y implies y and x of course but x and y implies z does not entail y and z implies x so you cannot just take a place where X and Y was and, and plug there Y and X. It, it may not be derivable. Okay. So there are many such strange things because it's such a weak logic. It happens to be quite powerful, much more powerful than anything there is in, in or there was when we worked in trust uh, management. But of course, it's very weak logic. So the idea was to, to treat conjunction as sets. If a conjunction is a set, just by definition, then of course, let's see, it will be the same conjunction because it will be the same object. So you can, you can substitute, uh, there will be no difference between X and Y and Y and X. So one problem is that sets are not constructive objects. It may seem strange, but it, it's all. For example, suppose uh, Sasha Shen and I, and I decided to write a joint paper, but uh, to write such that nobody comes first. So if you write Gurevich and Shen, after Gurevich comes first. Shen and Gurevich. Shen comes first. We can write whatever you do. It's not quite <laughs> quite achieves because whatever you do, it's not exactly set. It's kind of ordered set one one set ordered one way or another. So the obvious solution is to represent set as sequences by ordering them lexicographic. So, so, so we can write Gurevich Shen, but the, the order we say doesn't matter. So the geographical order does, does, doesn't matter, sort of. And so that we did, but it was very complicated. Stanislav, don't worry, I'm finishing. <laughs> so this is my last essentially slide. So it turns out the problem is not so, it's solvable in expected linear time, not deterministic linear time, but expected linear time. But uh, randomness is introduced by the algorithm, not, we don't propose, uh, presume any dis probability distribution of inputs, it just uh, randomness is introduced by the algorithm. 
And expected linear time in practice, of course, as good as uh, linear time. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri.